Hello everyone, welcome to another fun-sized edition of ARG Presents. I am Amigo Aaron, joined this week by a man who, much like Mr. Game & Watch, is colorless, two-dimensional, and shallow, The Brent. I also have very few frames of animation. That's true. Give us a demonstration. <laughs> the more Brent. I can just sit around, the better. <laughs> so, if you tuned in last week, and a few of you did, we spun the wheel, we made the deal, and this week, in an unusual twist... We will be playing games on the exotic, old-school, revolutionary Game & Watch platform. Times 50, yeah. So, Brent, out there. what do you know about the Game & Watch platform? You know, I unfortunately, I was never uh, fortunate enough to have a Game & Watch. Really, I was too young to have a Game & Watch. When these <sighs> were at their peak of popularity, I would have been like six. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I would have probably enjoyed the games, but I, I obviously was it. Uh, coherent enough to ask for them. Um, however, as time went on, I have played some of these in different forms. Um, the Nintendo variants are always far superior than the knockoffs that you find, you know, just other companies making these type of games. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, I'm not young enough to have not played these and played, <laughs> played quite a few of them. And turns out three of the four games today I already played in my youth. It's yeah, one of those things I, where you forget until you play them again. Let's learn about the Game & Watch a little bit. So, of course, the Game & Watch was a uh, a uh, brand that came out of Nintendo, the big N. Now, this thing debuted all the way back uh, in April 28th of 1980. Yes. Can you believe that? Yeah. Long, long ago. These were very early. And they ran all the way up until October 14th of 1991. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, the, how long they ran, I think, is far more impressive than when they started. This was a long-running series, very successful, and combined units sold in this estimated worldwide. Get this. You ready for this? Uh, of all these little units, they've sold an estimated 43.4 million units. Wow. Is that, that crazy or is that crazy? That is, that's a ton of Holy units. Holy cow. So... Let's you know we talked about this gentleman before, but the the brain the, the master this was the brainchild of a fellow named Gumpe Yakoi. Yes, you'll remember him from our uh, Wonder Swan yep. episode. If you were one of the few that tuned in for that one, <laughs> and uh, the fan choice. So was that the fan choice? That I was. can't remember. So uh, Gumpe Yakoi, a smart man, and he got his inspiration for this uh, allegedly, legendarily, from being on a train and watching a businessman screw around with a calculator. Yep. And he was trying like, to entertain himself. That's right. He's like, you know, I could, could do something like that. And so the idea for a, uh, a little handheld unit that had a clock on it and an alarm was born, which is basically what these things were. Um, and the Game & Watch came into fruition. The very first Game & Watch was a game simply titled Ball. Ball, yeah. <laughs> ball. Did you play ball or look at ball? I, I know ball, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> most of the Game & Watches... Uh, well, you had several different varieties of models of Game & Watch. You had uh, uh, some that were just one singular unit, flat, uh, that you held in your hand, sort of like a uh, like maybe a, a Game Boy Micro or something, you yes. know, like a little like that. Then you had some that were like clamshell, that were sort mm -hmm. of like the Game Boy Advanced, all right? Uh, uh, or the, or the, the, DS. the DS. Yeah, they, have, they, they would close like this. Then you had some bizarre units, like uh, we'll get into later, that opened up side, like sideways like, like this, like a book. Yep. Uh, and then you even had some units that were manufactured. I think Coleco was behind these that were almost like small tabletop arcade versions yes. of the original Game & Watch games. And some were multi-release. Sure. You would get some that are were pocket-sized and then some that you know was pocket-sized and arcade-style. Yeah, so... Uh, these had used uh, button cell batteries, yep. so they were small. Um, in most situations, the battery life needs to be about six months of, yeah, of, of play. Yeah, a long time. That's yeah. amazing, six months. But of course, uh, these, of course, were LCD games, uh, liquid crystal displays, which means uh, if you if you lit the screen fully up, you would see every bit of animation of every of every character in the game, every frame of it. Yep. And so what the what the what the game and watches would do is just light up the appropriate. Uh, picture at the appropriate time to yep. match what was going on the street. So they're actually quite, uh, they're quite simple. And these games, the LCD technology of this style was obviously popular in the 80s. And, and as you mentioned, there were knockoffs, and I, I had a couple of the knockoffs uh, over the years. Uh, and uh, they even, this sort of technology was even transferred eventually into the, until, to uh, the watch 
you know, games and yes. had this sale where I found the watches to be too small to really get much, derive much pleasure from play. Did you ever play the watch ones? I did. In fact, I remember uh, sitting in church as a small child, borrowing one of your friends, my friends too, yeah. uh, Tim's. Had a Pac-Man watch, yeah, and I would borrow it, and it had one of the screw-in joysticks that would attach to the side of the watch normally, and I would play that during church. Maybe that accounts for a lot of things. Yeah, it explains a lot. So something about the manufacturing of these before you go on. Yeah, I watched a video with one of these taken apart, and the color that you see, the the static color, is actually multi-layered on some of these games. Some have imprinted onto the screen, like uh, screen silk printed onto the screen, and then there's a separate piece of plastic that goes on top of that, so it gets kind of that parallax background effect. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, the backgrounds in these, I mean, obviously there's there's color. Yeah. And they what they would do it a lot often would be they would build a lot of the base graphics just out of the out of a picture. Sure. And they would yeah. lay that the LCD on top of them. That that was generally the way they did it. And the effect was was probably you, if you consider the time that's a mobile unit, it's pretty good. You well, know? And like I said, the multi layer effect, uh, where you had something farther into the background that was actually printed on, physically on the screen, and then a sheet of plastic that sat on top of that, actually gave the games a small amount of depth. It really helped with the effect. Yeah. Uh, now get this, Brent. There were fifty nine different Game and yeah. Watch games produced. And then there was one that was given away as a prize. All right, so that total there were sixty. Yep. Uh, that's crazy. That's it a is. lot of games. Um, and uh, the the prize ones, of course, are super rare. They were only ten thousand produced, and they were never available for sale. And you got those uh, if you won a, a, a the a Nintendo F one Grand Prix tournament. They were given to the winners of that. Yes. Yeah, I've seen the cases, and I've seen them up on eBay before. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 nutty. Um, so. There were a ton of these uh, different releases as we mentioned. There were sixty. Uh, had you played any before this game, this show here? Yes, yes. Uh, aside from uh, the late, one you mentioned, yeah. Later and later on in life, I've actually had the chance to play two or three of these. None of the ones that we played today. Right. Um, so the uh, the the neat thing about these were is that they travel. Like I said, they traveled well, and they were and the battery life was high. And I can tell you, this is hard for uh, younger people to understand, but. Uh, in the time before cell phones or Game Boys or portable systems, you would sit in the car and you would play like license plate games or you would play uh, I Spy yep. or read a book if you could stomach that while you were driving. I mean, it was a whole different world. And my kid, if he's in the back seat for one second without a game in his hand, he gets upset. He, he, he always wants continual uh, uh, fun. And so the early way to get around that was where the old handheld like marble games yeah. and the uh, games where you use like I remember there was one where you would be in a, a tank of water and you and you would use these tool controls to squirt things up and forth there's little games where you tried to move tiles into a certain thing they were all little mechanical handheld games the little pinball games where you just shot a marble <laughs> with a spring and it kind of landed right. on your dish and try to get high scores if yeah. you think about that sort of gaming Okay, and then this comes along. A you can understand. Well, yeah. you can understand how games like this, as simple as they are, could become popular because Absolutely. you were. I mean, it was sort of a quantum leap uh, from from uh, what we had been doing, you know. And of course, we were, you know, before that, kids just. Did, I just I guess they just sat there, and talked. You know, no one wants to talk in the car. Screw that. <laughs> so uh, when these things came out, they were pretty neat. Now. Uh, like I said, I never had one. And I was telling Brent earlier, I don't even remember asking for one because I, I don't know. I, I thought they were okay, you know. I, I was, but the, but uh, my friends had them, and when I friends had them, I'd play them, and so they were they were good for a good time. Now most of these things have a uh, 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 two different settings, an A and a B game, uh, and generally, with some exceptions, uh, the B game is just a sort of like the advanced level yeah. of the A game. Yeah. Uh, it's not like they're adding a bunch of new gameplay elements. It's just faster or more or di more difficult. Yes. Um, the Game of the Watches had various types of control. Uh, quite a few of them have buttons for that control your character uh, to go left and right or to, or a left right and an action button. Yeah. Uh, some, as we'll get into later, introduced uh, different control elements to c coincide with the game that that was that was in the Game of Game of Watch item. Again, these things often had, um, they always almost always had an alarm and a uh, uh, time 
uh, thing. Can you in, can you think of reasons? I mean, do you think people really use these as clocks? Uh, I think the wash aspect <laughs> of it was mainly due to sell it to adults. I think it was something that you could say, well, yeah, it's a game, and I, I can play on it, but really I use it to tell my time. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that was a... a I think it was a, an excuse for Nintendo to get these in the hands of adults. Now, um, the funny thing about these is, is, is they uh, pretty much led directly to uh, the original Game Boy. Same guy. Even. And yeah. so, uh, who I'm um, clearly about the time the Game Boy came out, the technology had advanced to the point where you could do something uh, more advanced, sure, and more complicated than the Game and Watch. But the Game and Watch for their time, they're a really interesting piece of video game history. Uh, also, as I don't know if you're going to uh, touch on later, but the Game & Watch is what's responsible for the D-pad. Yes, which I will touch on later. All right. But uh, the, the, uh, uh, they were an interesting, they were an interesting uh, like, I don't want to say footnote, but they were a stepping stone to get something more advanced. Now, I'll have to say, <laughs> it, and it's tragic, absolutely tragic, that Gunpei died in a car accident the way he did. I think he would have had many, many more years of of success if had that not happened. He had invented and uh, came up with so many great concepts. So many. And Virtual Boy, obviously not his best, but so his games, his technology, he was someone that was just right there. He really knew what was going on. I agree. Now, uh, I don't know if you've ever played Super Smash Bros. for the uh, Wii uh, and Wii U. Absolutely. But yep. they introduced a character in there called Mr. Game & Watch. Yep. Now, uh, the Game & Watch, the legacy had continued throughout the years as various uh, uh, handheld ports, and even I think a console port or two on the Wii, had had had, uh, um, had basically redone the games for home use. You know, they, they you know in your current, whatever your current video game format was, mm-hmm. they, they put some of the games out. And uh, so Mr. Game & Watch was sort of the reference character for what all the little characters look like in the majority of the game. Yeah. I mean, there are some games that have, like, Mario, for example, right. as a character. But there's plenty of games that just have, like, Stick Guy, right. basically. And, and he became, uh, he showed up in a, in a Super Smash Brothers and became known as Mr. Game & Watch. And Mr. Game & Watch is a character that is uh, has jerky animation. And I know in Super Smash Brothers, I remember playing it with my kid on the Wii, he would use... Uh, various accoutrement from his various game appearances. Yes. He had a frying pan, yeah. for, exa- for example. Game & Watch bucket. He had a parachute. <laughs> you know, he had a bunch of stuff that he would have used in, in all the many games that he appeared in. And I always thought that was a, kind of a neat aspect of uh, Mr. Game & Watch. Another thing about Mr. Game & Watch, and this is according to Nintendo lore, he complete, doesn't understand what good and evil is. He's completely two-dimensional. He's light. You know, it's just this weird guy. Yeah. But he's around. And he's sort of... Now you sort of see him in a lot more stuff. He keeps popping yes. up in Smash and some other stuff. I always thought that was cool that they kept... One thing Nintendo does that I really like is that they hold on to their heritage quite nicely. Sometimes too much, but yes. Uh, and also, for anyone who might have not seen Game & Watch, he has a big round head yeah. with a big round nose. Uh, his body is mostly stick form, and he's got round balls for hands and feet. Right. So that is his basic uh, <laughs> makeup, and he's two dimensional. He, you know, you never see him really in a three D light. That's right. Uh, and so, but it's neat. Like I said, it's something they held on to. If you want, I don't. I'm not a huge fan of the Smash Brothers games myself, and the Smash Brothers games for the uninitiated are a game where they Nintendo gets a gains a gets a bunch of their properties and maybe some other stuff and throw them together, and they have like these little. Kind of cutesy, all on screen brawls, right? And uh, King, uh, King of the Mountain type things, where the object is not to kill your opponent; it's to knock them off the screen. You know, but I like the idea that they that they a lot of these uh, Super Smash Brothers or some of their like uh, kart racers, they bring back some of these people from yeah. the past. I always thought that was that was kind of cool. So, the, so we decided since these are diminutive titles. That we were going to each tackle two this week. Yes. And so I'm going to let you lead the charge this week, Brent. What do you got for us out of the gate? I so I'm going to start with Oil Panic. Okay. Oil Panic, uh, produced in '82. Uh, it was the 51st game, I believe, of the series. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's the 19th game. I was going to say, surely it's not yeah. that late. Yeah. It's the 19th game in the series. It, it, the model number is 51, because that's how it would be confusing. 
in Oil Panic, you are a gas station attendant who's uh, in charge of catching the droplets of oil that are leaking from the pipe above, putting them into a bucket, and then dumping them over the side to your manager who's waiting below who will then fill up the cars waiting for their gas. This is a horrible system. <laughs> this is cannot be safe. <clears throat> um, the game uh, just uses left and right controls. Um, he has a few frames of animation to go between five droplets of oil. Uh, you have three animation frames, uh, three or four, to get the oil into your bucket before it hits the ground and you uh, cause a fire and lose a life. If you catch it in your bucket, you can hold up to three in your bucket at a time. And your manager is just running back and forth on the screen below you. This is a dual screen game, uh, up and down. So you catch it, you run over to the side and you, you dump it over. If your manager catches it, you get points. If he doesn't catch it, you actually dump the oil onto the patrons waiting below. On one side of the screen, it's a that's great. It's a guy fueling, you know, trying to fuel up, and on the other side, it's a woman trying to fuel up. And if you dump it on them, they get this, you know, they have a few frames of animation of getting angry at you. Who wouldn't? <laughs> My God, that's super dangerous. Uh, the reason why I picked this game is what a weird concept for a game. Now, this is like I said, back in '82 where video games weren't defined by, you know, we've got to have a multi-billion dollar first-person shooter. Right. You know, this was, they were just throwing caution to the wind, seeing what would stick to the wall. Uh, and this is actually a fairly popular unit. It's not extremely rare. It's down pretty much middle of the road. Um, I enjoyed this. Uh, it's a little bit too simplistic for me, I mean, I, all the Game & Watch is somewhat simplistic, of course. Um, the only real challenge, catching the oil droplets in your bucket isn't really the challenge. It's timing it to dump it over the side to your manager below. Yeah. Um, so I I would rate this probably about a C on my Game & Watch set scale. What do you think about this one? Oh, this game is your... Uh, there's a lot of game ones on the Game of Watch that are like this. It's, it's, yeah. it's, I call it the Lucille Ball effect. You run around like <laughs> a maniac trying to keep up with, the, uh, with, with the, what's happening and not and not uh, make an idiot of yourself. That's right. And so I, I, the concept of this one is so idiotic that I love it, of course. Yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, and of course, if you're watching on video, you can this this is the one that he's doing right here. It's the a screen above a screen, and the way it's set up is incredibly clever. Oh, uh, sure. I mean, it's uh, now it uses both those screens. You can see how the DS came right out of these. Oh yes. I mean, it's Absolutely. dead obvious. Absolutely. Uh, uh, that 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 they pulled the idea directly from the game and watch again. Think of all the things this thing spawned, yeah. and, and at least in some degree. Yep. Uh, but. <laughs> this is a fun game. Again, like Brent said, I mean, simply you're moving back and forth. Yeah, I believe you've got buttons for left and right on this yes. and one action button. Uh, and uh, it works. You know, it works okay. Uh, again, if you, you've you got to put yourself in the context of, of the time period, but it's fun. And the fact, one thing that's I like with these, is especially most of the knockoffs of Nintendo Game & Watches were really simple. And Nintendo, to their credit, I mean, this has enough... Uh, and a lot of their games are like this. It has just enough depth to be a game. I agree. You know, that, and, and I think the extra screen is what adds that depth. It helps. It certainly yeah. helps. And also, unlike some of the other uh, knockoffs that are just out there to make a quick buck, they'll just slap some kind of title, so you know, a sports title or whatever on it, and shut it up the door. The characters in this are big and chunky. Yeah. Which allows them... The, the one or two frames of animation they have to be impressive. Yeah. Um, instead of just being, you know, just rudimentary shapes or whatever, you get a, when, like, especially when you dump the oil on the woman's head, she has a great frame of animation where she's just freaking out. It's just I sort love of it. tilted sideways. Yeah. Like, just, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it gives, it allows them to put some amount of character into their little, you know, one frame of animation, it's which a, is really nice. It's a video game at its simplest form. It is. It really. I mean, it really is. But, I mean, yeah. I, I like this one. This is one that I'd played before. 
And uh, uh, boy, I thought it was really, I thought it was fun. It was, and when we, uh, the second I turned it on, I'm like, I know this. Yeah. And I remembered it instantly. I was like, oh yeah, I remember playing this. And it was fun. It's it's a simple, fun, and I enjoyed that one. So overall, my my second choice, I tried to stick with games that would would never be made into games nowadays. So the first one was uh, yes, because you could not make this one. Yes, the first one, of course, was tr- fueling up cars, basically. The from my second hand one from a pipe <laughs> in a bucket. My my second choice was rain shower. I a game about drying clothes <laughs> on a clothesline. Yes. Uh, in this game, it is a book format, which means it opens up left to right instead of up to down. And you have a long, two long stretching clotheslines that you have to move left and right to avoid getting wet from the rain falling from above. Now that is a concept for a video game if I've ever heard one. You know, when I was a when I was a little kid, <laughs> yeah, okay, not that little, but pretty little. Everyone had clotheslines yes. in their yard. Yeah, and if you go around for the West, big stuff, and I'm sure, and maybe in other countries, these are far more prevalent still. I don't know, but in America, pretty much the dryer took care of this. But a lot of people had clotheslines. In fact, we had clotheslines in our old in our old house. Yeah, and where well, mom and dad lived, we had that. Yeah, we had them up where mom and dad lived now. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and Teresa's mom has them as well, and they were just like these T shapes, and you'd run a line between them, and you'd hang your clothes out to dry. Now, modern day, you still see them rusted away occasionally. Most yes. people had them removed because of dryers, but it does amuse me. And this is your classic, almost like a New York scene where the people used to string the lines between the buildings, the buildings yeah, and they had the pulleys, and they would put their clothes out there and dry them. Uh, it's a throwback. It you is. Know, it's a big time throwback on that. So, and I'd say this is one of, of all the, the four games we did today. This one I had not seen. And this so, is a rare, a rarer title. Much, much rarer and title. And the fact that it opens up like a book. Yeah. And it has two screens stacked sideways. I think that's extremely clever. It is. This was released in 83, the end of uh, October of 83. This is the 30th game of the Game & Watch series. Uh, like I said, it opens up like a book. This has a D-pad. Up, down, left, right, D-pad, right. and an action button, which basically uh, pulls or pushes your line to avoid the raindrops. Um, you actually have four positions around the screen for which you can move these clothing, and the rain comes usually uh, on the higher levels. You're getting three or four drops at a time that you have to kind of maneuver these things around. Um, you know, I didn't mention the sound back in Oil Panic, but I'm going to mention it on here because it's basically the same. All of these games are very beep boopy, right? Uh, they all sort of have the exact same beeps and boops. Yes. Some, it is more effective one, uh, especially Oil Panic, when you pour it over the side and you pour it on someone, the, the beeps and boops sound angry. I don't know how they do it, but it's, they, quick, they sound short, angry beep, to beep, me. Beep, beep, yeah. Now, in this game, I don't think they used to sound well at all. Uh, when you click your clothes wet if a rain falls on them your guy kind of throws a fit and he wrings out the shirt uh that you're drying but it doesn't use the beeps and boops efficiently in my opinion uh what this game does do well though is if you have if you play it on game b it, it adds a crow or if you get far enough into the game eventually you'll go to the crow level as well and the crow in this will pull your line even if you're not pulling it. So it kind of pulls it back into the droplets. Or sometimes it pulls it away, uh, but you go up and you pull it back and then you pull it right into a droplet. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, it's an enemy in the game where our, uh, Oil Panic didn't really have an enemy. You were just trying to complete a task. This game actually has an enemy, the crow. The crow, unfortunately, I don't think it's enough frames of animation. It doesn't have anything there to really flesh it out that it's evil, even though it's trying to make you fail at your task. So, I mean, from this point of view, it's an evil bird. Um, I actually, of the f- games we played, this was my least favorite game. And it's not because of the subject matter, and it's not because of the crow. It's just so much of this game is setting and doing nothing and still succeeding. Because Wait, yeah, because if either. your clothes are in the right position, the rain is just falls right down through them and it doesn't hit anything. So you're just sitting there waiting for a rain to be problematic. Right. 
how did you feel about I, this? I one? felt well. I mean, it was. I thought this was the, the easiest of the bunch because you don't. Because it like is you said, definitely the easiest. You can yes. you can sit there now. And if you play the B game, it's a little more frantic. It, yeah, yeah, but it's uh, faster, and the crow <laughs> does add some element of difficulty. I guess I was enamored by the design of the game as much as I was anything else, yes. and, the, and the subject matter because it's so clever. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, this was the easiest of, uh, of the three, and this is another one where it, it's just a, a, a twitchy sort of affair. You're trying to avoid the rain drops, but until the rain gets hot and heavy, you can. It's not that tough. You can get pretty far. Yeah, yeah. and the scoring on this is kind of weird because if you don't, it, when you get to a hundred, <laughs> there's a break in the clouds, and you get a ten point bonus. All right. But the ten point bonus is kind of silly because if you make it to a hundred, you get a ten point bonus. It's not like if you do well enough, you get the 10-point bonus, you know, or if you make it to 100 without dying, you get a 10-point bonus. So anyone who gets to 100 gets a 10-point bonus. But if you get to 100, you get to, everyone gets that 10-point So the bonus means nothing. Right. Later in the game, something to do do that's clever with scoring is if you make it to 300 and you haven't lost a life, then all your points are doubled from that time on. If you have lost a life when you get to 300, you get all your lives back. So the scoring on it is a little bit interesting, but for me, it didn't hold my interest to want to get to 300. So unlike Oil Panic, where I was at least amused by the animation, the, uh, uh, the sound was somewhat amusing, this really had nothing to hold me in except for the crow and like i said before the crow was just not a big enough part of the game yeah i i have got to agree with you on that but i mean it is i think it looks nice too it it, it does it's okay <laughs> the house the background for the house is uh, uh colorful enough i mean it's it's only a few colors but it's used well and then there's a garage on the side so it, it, it fills the screen with some amount of color so yeah unlike oil panic that's something actually it does not do well is the building and the cars uh, at the gas station? While they're there, they're very brown. They're very bland. They didn't. I think they could have made those pop more, uh, especially the cars, because the cars never move, but they're still just you know nothing. I think they could have made those fancier, you know, to look nicer. Maybe so. Maybe so. <clears throat> I like both yours actually. I, mean, I thought they were good. All right. Let's well. Let's move on to yours. What do you got? So. Um... I wanted to go with a couple that I'd played before, since I so I, I could talk about them uh, uh, from someone uh, pr- the perspective of someone who actually had physically held the game in my hand. So I went with a couple that I have to say are probably two of the more popular ones, if not maybe the most popular ones. So we're going to start off with uh, the Game and Watch version of Donkey Kong. Now, okay. Uh, this one came out in uh, 1982, and it was developed at the exact same time as Oil Panic, and came out just a few weeks later. Yes. Uh, so, uh, clear, the 20th game. So yeah. this, so Donkey Kong obviously is a is a game and watch rendition of the classic Nintendo game Donkey Kong in the arcade, which I actually mentioned on our Thanksgiving show. If you uh, caught that, uh, so clearly I'm a, I was a fan even back in those days. I love Donkey Kong. It's funny to think that these are contemporary with those classic games. So it's, I mean, yes. it's like quite amazing. Yep. So. Uh, what is Donkey Kong? Well, it's a, it's a, uh, and if you're watching at home, it, it would be this one right here, this double screen unit. Uh, what they try to do is they try to take the very first level of Donkey Kong and make it play a playable LCD game. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, uh, you play Mario, and he looks, he looks different than uh, Mr. Game and Watch. I mean, yes. he, he looks like Mario, sort of. And you are tasked with running up these girders to rescue. Uh, your uh, Pauline at the top of the screen. And, of course, Donkey Kong's up there chucking barrels at you. So it's a pretty good representation of the actual arcade game, uh, except, it's of course, you it's cl- clearly smashed down quite a bit, and you've got the one level in this game. So what they've done is they've pre-rendered all the girders. Yes. Which was smart, because that makes it look like the arcade. Yes. And you're actually excelling past what you really had the technology to do, right? And then your little guy... Uh, frames along the girders, and this thing features the main points of that level. You've got the girders, you've got the ladders, you've got the barrels, yeah. right? It even features the flaming barrel at the bottom, yes. which is nice. Yes, a and nice touch. A nice and that touch. looks nice. Uh, and so you bebop along, dodging barrels and going up the ladders. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, uh, it, you uh, once you get to the top, there has a there's an addition that was not in the arcade which is, there's a swing, and this would have been cool for the arcade, actually, at some point. 
there's basically a cherry picker or a crane at the top, and it's got a hook hanging off of it. Mario has to jump on the hook, swing across the top level where Donkey Kong is, and Donkey Kong, and that means you finish that level. And when you finish it enough times, uh, Donkey Kong actually falls, and the whole night, just like in the arcade, and you, and you and you've beaten you know that set of levels. Yeah, basically. when you ride on the hook, uh, what it's trying to represent is you're pulling out support, right. for the for the level that Donkey Kong is standing on, throwing the barrels. Right. Down. So uh, of course you don't really. It, it's obviously not every aspect of the arcade machine is there, but Donkey Kong chucks barrels. They, they sort of they they sort sort of chucks them in a random way. He he basically goes back and forth along the beam and chucks these barrels and. Sometimes he'll get right in one spot and chuck a bunch straight yes. down, you know. And he makes it tough. Uh, the B game, he's he, his barrels are a lot harder to dodge. He really goes he goes a little crazy on the on the B game. Um, one thing this game uh, did was uh, inadvertently revolutionize controls. Yeah. And what they did was, uh, as Brent touched on this earlier, uh, but uh, this game required a character to go up, down, left, right, and have an action, and so. Uh, uh, buttons they did not think would do the job since most of the most of the games that required you to go left and right just use buttons for those two you know, very small buttons mm -hmm. and so what they did was they came up with the Nintendo crosshair control which is the you know the uh, the the, the, the plus yep. right the D pad and they put a little, uh, Gope, uh put a little uh, and his crew put a little dot in the middle a little a little indention so people wouldn't have to keep looking at their fingers. They were worried people... This is funny. The, the amount of thought they put into this, I don't know how long it took them, but they... If you think about uh, the, the plus sign or the gamepad setup, uh, if you put your thumb on there, you I could see how people, when this didn't exist, would think people could get lost because when you're using those buttons, you sort of have a feel for the buttons on your thumb. Yeah. And you could see it. So and they put the little, the little pimp, the little indention in there, the dimple, uh, to keep you from uh, getting lost on the D-pad, and it worked. And uh, eventually, they ended up uh, going in and 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 you know, and put a patent in for that. And the rest is history. That 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 ended up being the uh, the control. The D-pad ended up being what they used pretty much going forward. Yes, right? and pretty much everyone else has tried to emulate. Yeah. Uh, Anything, any controller that you see that doesn't have a standardized D-pad is because they didn't want to pay Nintendo the licensing fee. Right, right, right. Um, again, this was the clamshell uh, style uh, uh, game, so it closes, uh, which again is very similar to the to the modern DS. Uh, and uh, it for and they, they use the multiple screens just for the level. Uh, it's sort of a simulating a vertical arcade screen effectively sure. Sure. Uh, with with it with Mario going up uh, as as you go forward in this game the in the in the really first level you just kind of jump up on the on that crane hook and swing up and you're and you're in as you go forward that crane mo that thing moves it makes it a yeah. lot more difficult to time there are more timing elements involved but i mean it's a pretty simple game uh, uh, for overall and it does a pretty good job i think uh playing an LCD version of the first level of Donkey Kong. What, what did you think about it? This is by far my favorite Game & Watch game that I've played. Really? I'm sure there are some out there yeah. that I haven't played that might be better. <coughs> Excuse me. The detailing on this is remarkable. Some Something that Aaron didn't mention is there are sections in the uh, barrel jumping part where you can't jump because there is a, a girder too far down, so you jump and hit your head. And you and that kills you. <laughs> yes. So you have to time it. You have to because there you have to remember there's no jumping forward in this game. You jump straight up and come straight back down. So you have to time it so you can either run far enough to jump for a barrel to go under you, because there are portions where you can't jump, or you have to just wait. And the other aspect of this, on the bottom screen, uh, if you get far enough into the game, there's a portion where a girder is animated, going left and right yeah. at the top. So if you jump in that section where you normally be able to jump freely, if you jump and hit that, you die. Yeah. Um, when you go up onto the second screen, you actually have to flip a switch to get the crane to activate. And it only swings twice 
before it stops. Then you have to go re hit the switch. And and Donkey Kong is at the is right there at the top. So he's throwing barrels straight down and he will camp where you were supposed to jump on that hook like crazy. <laughs> if you just try to hit the switch, run over and jump on, he will smack you with a barrel every time. And he'll he'll rapid fire shot straight. It's not like yes. the game. He will sit there and just throw barrels right down. Yes. He, does, he doesn't make them roll. He'll throw them. Uh, he, <clears throat> the, the, I played this, I way played this one the most of everything we played. Because you can usually get the feel of a game and watch game in about a half an hour. I mean, you pretty much, in a half an hour, you've seen everything that it's, the game's going to throw at you. Mm. I played this for about an hour and a half. And the only reason why I quit was because I had to come film. Uh, <laughs> I, in fact, I played this one, and then I played the others, and I came back to this one because I enjoyed it that much. It is complex for a Game & Watch, and it's actually somewhat complex for just a video game in general. There are things, there are defined rules that you can and cannot do, and you have to try to accomplish your goal with those in mind. And it adds new elements as you come on. Uh... It took me I, probably more tries than I want to admit on air to actually complete the first level to pull out all the things and make Donkey Kong fall down. Because you have to do it, I think, five times. Yeah. You have to get to the top and hit the hook five times. And that is on game A. And he gets really, Donkey Kong gets real um, miffed after about the third oh go Oh my gosh, when you're going for that last <laughs> yeah. one, you have to bait him to come over and try to throw barrels at you at the switch or at the middle. Or he would just camp right at the hook, and you'll never get it done. I spent, honest to gosh, six or seven minutes trying to get the last one on the top screen, hitting the switch, going over to try to jump, because the hook's swinging, cause he, so you have to time that too. And I'd get over there, and I'd get ready to jump, and he'd start throwing the barrels after retreat. Great time. I was If I ever found this out in the wild to buy... I own it. It's that good. Yeah, it's a fun game, and, and holy and, cow, and for it was instance, fun. It added a lot more elements than most of the game watch games had. It did. But then yeah. again, uh, uh, the rumor was that this when they ported this over, the guys really took it seriously. They wanted to do the best they could. Oh, which I think they probably did the most. Oh game. my god! I, you know, but I, uh, they really wanted to <laughs> try to recreate something that uh, that was special. Yeah. You know? If I had a choice between playing this and the arcade version, obviously I'm going to play the arcade version, right? Mm-hmm. Nine out of ten times. But on that tenth time, I'm telling you, I'm going to walk away from the arcade version, pick this up, and play it. It's that good. It's fun. It's it, that good. It's often featured, you know, they, they sometimes will, uh, uh, when you see a Game & Watch game anywhere, this is almost always the one they come up with. Now, Absolutely, because it is not rare. I mean, there are tons well, of them out well, there. Well, I'm getting ready to get into that. So, this game sold uh, one million units. Yes. Right? <laughs> so, it was a very popular game. Absolutely. And uh, it did incredibly well. And uh, so, aside from the fact that it uh, it produced that uh, c the controller, it also was just a great game that did well. Yeah, and this is the twentieth Game and Watch game released. I bet this is one of the reasons why they got up to sixty, because the popularity and this. I bet they tried to capture that lightning in a bottle here on out after this one sold so well. If you compare this one to the, the oil game that you did. Uh, in terms of the actual gameplay and the and the complexity, it does crush that crushes one. Crushes it. Yeah. Holy cow. So that's uh, Donkey Kong. Yes. And, and so along those same lines, uh, I had played another game from back in the day. This one was called Mario's Cement Factory. Yeah. Now, this is actually uh, a little bit like uh, uh, Brent's first game in the in concept. There's a lot of... Uh, Level, le uh, lever hitting and stuff falling between multiple levels. This is the only game that we cover, which if you're watching at home, it's this one right here. That's a single screen affair, Brent, yeah. uh, that, that uh, we're looking at today. So, this is an interesting game. Now, you're Mario, and you are running a cement factory. Now, this <laughs> cement factory is cheap, apparently. <laughs> and they've decided that they're going to hire three people, a couple of cement truck drivers, and Mario, and that's it. And Mario is the one-man show in this. So, picture in your mind uh, um, s several levels. At the top levels, you've got uh, uh, two areas that have a handle. and a, Well, there's a nozzle shooting cement down, and there's a bucket. 
and there's a handle. Then underneath that, there's another bucket and a handle, and underneath that is our two cement trucks. Yes. Mario has to go from platform to platform and before these things fill up with cement, pull the handle down so it'll go to the next level, pull it again so it'll go to the truck. Here's the problem. Whoever designed this cement factory was a real jerk. And so what he did was he put a couple of elevators in the middle of the screen. <laughs> What a what a what a what a weasel! And not good elevators either. No. Randomly moving elevators. Randomly moving. So what you have to do basically is go back, and you have to use the elevators to get up and down. As yeah. we should mention that there is no stairs or ladder. So these elevators are necessary, but they're also not reliable. You and they also <laughs> screw you. And so you've got to run back and forth across the screen, pull these levers. To let the cement that's gathered in the in the top bucket go to the second bucket, do it again, put it in the truck. I mean, that's it's actually a pretty uh, hectic game. You it know? is. And uh, so Mario runs back and forth. You try to you try to put, get the cement in the in the at the to the bottom of the screen in the truck without uh, overflowing the cement bucket. If you overflow the cement bucket, you're you're dead. Also, Mario could die if he if he basically jump, falls into an elevator shaft, effectively. Yep. Or gets squished by right, the top. Or gets mashed. Uh, so this is not a good way to go for the Mario. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a, it's well rendered. I thought it looked nice. I thought they did a real good job. Uh, uh, you know, showing you what you're doing. Uh, you've got the, like I said, you've got the little levers there that you pull to empty the cement. That's pretty much it. You you it's a it's a two button game with a, with an action button. So it's got three buttons total: left, right, and action. No need for the uh, crosshairs in this nope. one, and uh, that's it. Well, what did you think of this one, Brent? Yeah, this is the 29th game released for those keeping keep score at home. Um, I liked this one. Unfortunately, I didn't like it a ton. Uh, I I felt like first of all the static graphics. I don't think they put enough time and effort into it. Uh, the the <coughs> factory that you're working in is all girders. They're yeah. all red girders. So it's not besides, super attractive. No, it's yeah. not. And also the animation of your character, because uh, he, he's a big beefy sprite, because he's the only thing moving around. Uh, oh, and the cement. <coughs> well, and the cement. But he is just. I don't. I thought he was poorly done. Not poorly done as in. You know, because you're working with one frame of animation here. I just think they could have made his expression uh, more panicked. I think they could have done more with that. Something else, the sound on this was is garbage. <laughs> well, uh, it's just, uh, well, wait a minute. Now, none of these have the best sound. No, no, no. <laughs> but some of the other games use the sound effectively. Oil Panic being by far the best looking, in my opinion, and the best animated, in my opinion, and the best sound, in my opinion, just not the best game. That is Donkey Kong, no doubt. Yeah, Donkey Kong, the sound's pretty pedestrian. I mean, you, it, it beeps when you think it's it sad, is. yeah. And, and the, the girders uh, layout in Donkey Kong are at least interesting because they have multiple shades yeah. of, of orange. Uh, so it has a little bit there. The Mario Cement Factory is all one color. It's all... Uh, 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 just straight lines. There's no, except for the cement trucks at the bottom, they're a little bit fleshed out, but not great. Uh, but the game itself is not very fun either. It's another game, sort of like Rain Shower, where you're standing around a lot waiting for something to happen. Uh, on, on game A, the cement doesn't always fill up. So sometimes you'll have buckets going across the top that are just empty, that just slide across the screen, and they dump nothing, and you do nothing. So there's a standing around element. Um, Although it does, it, it ramps up pretty quickly. It yeah. does, but it still has standing around elements. Uh, you never, ever, ever, at least I didn't, I never died by cement overflow. No, I it was always, elevator. I always yeah. fell through an elevator shaft. Now, on the B game, that's a whole different kettle of fish there. You get a lot <laughs> You get a lot more action. Well, you get a lot, yes. You get a cement, lot. Cement-wise. Yes. And, and the cement things that you, you pull the levers on can hold three before they overflow. So. And the cement are literally portrayed like basically they're like one, if you look, they're one thin segment yeah, and of three in the bucket. Yeah, 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 that is well done. You you know when you're in danger. Right. Um, another thing I didn't like was when you pull the lever to make the cement go down, it only drops one Splash. block yeah. of cement. And I understand why, because you might only want one to go. 
but you're staying at the cement thing and you pound in the, the, the flush button to make it fall, but it still has to let one go, <laughs> the animation for that to finish. Yeah. The next one, it has to slide down into the, the vat you're standing at and then you have to hit it again to make it go down. Well, I think that's part of the I think that's part of the foundation of the gameplay. Uh, because it they it, what that does is when it gets faster, it, it makes it so you can't sit there and hit the empty that thing out. Maybe you have to leave some in. You, you know, I, I so suppose, that, and then you have to run across I the suppose. screen, which happened to me quite a bit because it like Brent says, you don't just go through there and hit the button and all plops out. You're like, woo, I'm out. You, yeah, you, no, you have to. Yeah, you have to. It's the wait worst for the when animation. you're dumping it into the truck. And you just and, and you just look it up and all the submits that you're like, yeah. oh, <laughs> son of a, come on. The other aspect of this is the elevators, of course, and the elevators in the middle. Evil. They're they're they don't. There are four or five platforms beside each in two rows yeah. or two columns, I should say, and they don't move at the same rate, and they don't move, and there aren't they aren't full the entire time. So you might have platform. Nothing, nothing, nothing platform. And on the other side, you might have platform, platform, platform. And Mario cannot go down. Like, he has to have the platform right where he has to be. Yes. If it's below there's, him, there's he's, no he's, fall he's dying. All. Yeah. So, I mean, I know that is certainly an aspect of the game that you're supposed to try to overcome, but I found it so frustrating. So frustrating. So this game, even though I liked it better than uh, Rain Shower... I did not like it as much as Oil Panic, and I certainly didn't like it as much as Donkey Kong. I would put this one, I would rate them Donkey Kong 1. Yes, at, with, oh, without um, question. I would rate, actually, I like this one second best. I'll be okay. honest with you. I, I like an Oil that. third, and then the uh, the your uh, the closed Rain one shower. last, Rain Shower. Now, that doesn't mean uh, uh, that the, the other ones aren't good. In fact, I like, I like both yours, but... I just think these are more. There's more going on. They're more complex. There's more game. Sure, that's what. I, that's what. I, that's what I go. Now this one, I should mention, uh, sold seventy seven hundred fifty thousand copies. So it was. It had. A, it did a very good job, as well, uh, and uh, was uh, a, a very popular title. Now again, we 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 just discussed that, that through fifty nine of these, and we're going to throw out the sixty twist since it was a contest. We know fifty nine of these sold forty three million. So we and so we know just the two I've selected alone sold almost two million units. Yeah. So it, uh, it's interesting, uh, and I wonder what the uh, and I'm guessing like yours. I know the oil one you picked is very popular. That's another yeah. one I've seen quite a bit. So I would say it did pretty well as well. Uh, at rain shower certainly did not do as well. Uh, the numbers on it, the rarity of it is a lot higher than some of the other games. Speaking of that, let's go through the prices. I've got them pulled up here. We'll start with uh, Mario's Cement Factory. Uh, these are all compiled eBay prices since 2013. Uh, and the quality range, they're, they're all kind of smooshed together, so you get an overall general average of what you'd be paying for one of these right now. Obviously, if you've got one mint in box, the price is going to be higher. Or if you have one that's just a shell, it's going to be lower. Right. But this is the average kind of all around. This one, uh, Mario Cement Factory, you can get it for about 65 US bucks. Okay. That's, you know, that's actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, moving on <coughs> to Donkey Kong, it's going to run you about 73 bucks. And that's probably basically because there were so many. That otherwise, it probably would have been much more expensive. And it's yeah. a very, very good game. Yeah. Very, very good game. Uh, moving to Oil Panic, it runs about 74 bucks. Mm -hmm. Again, pretty popular game. Uh, uh, it, it has a bit of a uh, uh, fan following for whatever reason. And lastly, uh, Rain Shower, which is much harder to come by, but still, an adequate price at one hundred nineteen dollars. Mm -hmm. And these actually mesh with these. That, those prices fall in line with the current eBay stuff. I looked. Yep. That's about now. If you want to get the tabletop versions, you're going into a different level yes. of expense. A lot. Uh, the Mario's tabletop. Uh, the ones I looked at loose. Just that's just the game. Uh, you're looking at one hundred fifty five dollars for a cement factory. Yeah. Just on that one alone. So those you're going you're going into a, a, a new level of, of about one and a half times a financial pain when you get on that line. So I, clearly you were a big fan of the old game and watches. This is your first go around with them. The, right? I, well, like I said, I have played uh, actual game and watches 
throughout the years of me growing up, and I've played a ton of the clones. Yeah. Uh, and and someday we are going to look at some of the the clone type games, uh, not anytime soon. But uh, they have a point. They have a, a a point in video game history, and I think they need to be touched on. I agree. Sure. I agree. Uh, so. We bid adieu to the Game & Watch, and I think yes. I hear the alarm go oh, off. Oh, 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 it's time. It's time to hit the music. Yes. Rick, clear a path. All right. All right, Game & Watch. Down for a day. Let me tell the people what we added this week uh, on the old uh, Wheel of Fun. This week, we put on the Fairchild Channel F. Oof. F for fun. F for fun. Now, I'm going to hold this right like that. I kind of like the way that looks. Brent, right. give her a good spin, and let's see what we get this week. Really good spin. I like it. There's a glare, so I don't know what that is. All right, let me have a look here. And the winner is the 32X. Oh, holy moly. So, you know what? I I'm okay with that. That's a pretty fun thing. This is the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive 32X unit. Uh, the little mushroom shaped gimmick that. Uh, uh, unceremoniously was plunked into the top it, of the uh, Genesis. You know what? Interesting history. <laughs> if you don't know the history of this man, to definitely come back next week because yep. it's got some interesting history. I actually, for once, I have, uh, for it's been a while, but I have the, a 32X and yeah. I'll, I'll be pulling it out, setting it down. We're going to play us a 32X. I'm looking forward to that. That'll be fun. Yeah, it'll be a fun match. So, please, join us next week when we give the 32X a spin and until then, <laughs> meh, beep,